want to make such great content still available. So um, we will be videoing all of these, and we have for the last, I think, three or four at least. But we, um, I've been really looking forward to this presentation because um, I actually had art history as my major in college, but I never got to do anything with it till I got to be here. And, um, and so it's a topic near and dear to my heart. And I think Ruth has just the most um, interesting perspective. So I'm going to let Ruth kind of introduce herself and what her background is and why she's the person to uh, do this presentation. But I want to thank her. I know it's a lot of work to put together a presentation and she had to travel from Aonia, Hotchkiss. Yeah, and so, you know, we appreciate people. We have so much talent in this area, and part of what um, Voices of the Western Slope is designed to do is to showcase some of the knowledge and, and expertise we have, and we're privileged to do that in conjunction with the Delta County Library System. So, you don't need to listen to me. This is a by donation event, and uh, we thank you all for your donation. And without further ado, Ruth Pepper. Hi. Well, thanks for that nice introduction, Deb. And uh, I, I did teach for quite a long while, but what I have planned for you tonight, I hope, won't turn into an art history lecture. <laughs> Stop me if it does. <laughs> Uh, what I really wanted to talk about was more about us as viewers, and uh, especially, you know, we've been we were talking while Wayne was setting up my mic and all that stuff about how people have gotten more comfortable with maybe not coming out to events so much and so forth and being videotaped. Uh, that made me nervous when I found that out last night. <laughs> that was going to happen, but I'm actually on YouTube uh, before this because I did do it very short thing on the Harvest of Voices one time. So, you never know where you're going to end up. Well, this slide I put on here to be a little bit provocative, and uh, it also goes with the title, which people told me was a little bit provocative. Because they were, well, it was awkward, for one thing. I probably should have picked a different title. <laughs> but, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot because I was reminiscing about my teaching years and I, I was just telling Wayne at the beginning of the, uh, when I came in about John Powers. And he was a big collector of pop art and he was influential in Colorado. And um, when he was in his later years, he came to give a great talk, which unfortunately we were unable to tape because he moved the lavalier mic and uh, talked the other direction the whole time. And uh, so all we got was sort of mumbling, rustling of his tie thing going on the whole time. But one of the things that he said after a lifetime of being a, a big collector of pop art was people ask, you know, what, which, what should we collect? And he said, just buy what you love. Don't just buy because you're going to make it an investment. Don't buy it because you think it's an important artist. Buy it because you love it. Well, I've never really had a lot of money to buy art, but uh, I've collected it mentally. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, you know, I was interested in art for a long time, but I really got a lot of exposure to it after I started teaching and traveling. So uh, this slide is a little deceptive because I never met Andy Warhol. Sorry to disappoint you. He was on campus at Colorado State University, where I taught for 23 years, uh, to sign his artwork, which is what he's doing up there. And I just love the perplexed look on his face. And he has a camera in his hands. It's like he's trying to record his own experience as an artist. And uh, these cans had been removed from the front of the art building where I taught uh, before I arrived in 1989. and uh, put. Uh, in storage because uh, they were beginning to develop rust and they needed to be restored. And they have since been restored and they've been put back 
Uh, one sold to a Japanese buyer for some $165 million or something like that, which went immediately into helping the art building be refurbished. But um, uh, I've never seen the other two. They're around somewhere, I guess. So uh, anyway, you can buy it, but you can't own it. How do we appreciate art? And I intentionally picked art tonight that is probably not the kind of art that most of us would think of having in our living rooms in a frame. Uh, and before I get started, I wanted to especially express thanks for being invited to come here and speak. And um, so thank you to the Grand Mesa Arts and Entertainment Center, Deb Schaefer, and uh, also the Delta County Public Library, LaDonna Gunn, Marianne Pochi, and uh, also much help from the tech staff and the librarians who helped me get uh, a mass of a lot of uh, materials in order to kind of refresh my memory and uh, get this talk ready. I used to have a lot of art books, but when I moved over here from the Front Range, I got rid of them. <laughs> what were you doing? Exactly. Well, they were big and heavy, you know, art books are. So. Anyway, a few of them got checked out from the library, and it was so great to just be able to look through them. Beautiful. Well, uh, going back to my own uh, interest in art, I, I uh, put this image up here of 2001 A Space Odyssey because many people start uh, appreciating art at the entertainment level. They just want to go somewhere and be entertained. And I grew up in a household that had black and white TV. So on my 15th birthday, my dad took me and we went to the Boulder Theater and saw 2001, that was back in 1968, so now you know how old I am. And uh, it was mind-boggling for me to see this movie in a cinematic theater. Uh, the color, the uh, music, I was really mind-boggled by the music and the combination of all the visual and special effects that uh, got put into it by Stanley Kubrick. And I had read the novel, the short novel by Arthur Lee Clarke, so uh, I, I knew what the story was about. I didn't need to pay attention to the plot. <laughs> I just was taking it all in visually. So I became one of those individuals who stays to the bitter end of the, the movie and watches the credits and reads who did this. I mean, it takes a village of thousands of people to put together a movie like this. And I also got intrigued by some of the logos and uh, like, you know, even if MGM did not uh, produce this movie, they delivered it and distributed it. And uh, this particular logo caught my eye because it had the lion, which is what most people will remember from it. But in the film strip above, it says, Ars Gratia Artis. And of course, I didn't know Latin when I was, you know, a kid, but uh, I looked it up and it means art for art's sake. And that impacted me because, you know, you think of art as something that, to decorate a room or something to invest in or whatever, but what about art just for art's sake? And uh, I, I, I drew well when I was a kid. Mom brought home uh, stacks of mimeograph paper for me to just draw on because she didn't want me drawn on the walls. But uh, getting interested in, the, in other artists just... I felt like it was a really mind-boggling and mind-expanding experience. Oops. Okay, another influence for me personally uh, that takes me on up into my college years was uh, Laurie Anderson. And uh, I was attending the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley at the time, and I had a chance to go down and see her perform live. I love music. I played it in orchestras and stuff like that, so it really... Connected. I connected with her a lot because uh, she did everything. She spoke, meaningful messages, communicated well. That seems like a really good reason to make art. <laughs> uh, she performed music. She used all kinds of electronic devices like loopers and uh, vocoders that alter your voice. And uh, she put it all together on a video. Uh, and live stage performance. So here she is in several different performance modes. Uh, oh Superman, which is, was probably one of her iconic entrance into the avant-garde video 
world at the time, back in the 70s. Uh, Home of the Brave, Big Science, the United States, part one, two, three, and four. Well, here we are looking at stuff that you really can't collect. You can buy the albums. I have, uh, I have her LPs. <laughs> uh, you can play her music and you can uh, kind of reconstruct a live concert, but it's never quite the same as seeing a, a live performance of something like this. And uh, she, one of the other uh, things that I really respect about her is that she has had a lifetime of being in the arts. Uh, she was married to Lou Reed. She uh, lived in New York for a while, and she just has always been doing this thing where she's pushing out this form of communication, visuals, and, uh, and it's meaningful. It's not just thoughtless stuff. So uh, she, she re just released in 2015 a film that she produced herself called Heart of a Dog, and she um, reflects I wouldn't say it's sentimental, but she reflects a lot about the death of her husband, Lou Reed, uh, the death of her mother, and also the death of her little dear beloved dog, Lola Bell, which is featured in the movie. So um, it's just a, an arc that spans an entire lifetime, and I respect that a lot as a trait of creativity. So when, when you start looking at art from a different perspective of well, I don't really want that in my living room. You don't need to go there. Uh, but um, you begin to learn things that teach you about yourself as well. When I was a student at UNC, I was in a seminar class on contemporary art. And uh, I, I guess I thought art was painting and sculpting and stuff like that. You know, just your basic idea of making art. And um, so our professor, we were talking about contemporary art, like uh, this kind of conceptual art that's created by Saul LeWitt. And uh, we had a, about an hour discussion with other, of, of other artists besides this, but of the same kind. And uh, the professor went, asked us to go around the room and expound on something that we did not like. And I, th I, I don't know, I just, I didn't register that it might be a trick. <laughs> So I just blurted out, I said, well, I think solo wit is really boring. I mean, what is there to look at and what, what creativity is there in putting a bunch of cubes together? And um, so at the end, after we had gone around the circle and everybody had expressed what they didn't like, we were given the assignment to write a research paper on that very artist, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and one of the things that I, I want to express especially is that it really pays to go beyond the idea of just looking at something and saying, well, I don't like it, or, oh, I really like that. And that's sort of a dismissive gesture in both ways. So uh, getting pulled into this uh, research paper was profound for me because I found out Solowit was definitely not boring and definitely had a lot of brilliant ideas. Uh, I did still like his uh, wall drawings better than the cubes. <laughs> Um, and what I found out that was really interesting for Solowit is that he was disinvested in the idea of the artist having to do all the work to produce a work of art. Um, I guess in my mind I sort of had this idea of the sweat quotient, you know. Mm -hmm. I worked really hard on this and so it's a really great work of art. <laughs> and what Solowit did uh, in the book, books that I researched uh, back in the 80s, uh, was that he was sort of analogized to being like a composer of music. Uh, he would write out instructions or uh, sort of directions for uh, other people to create his works of art. And oftentimes they involve line drawings, which sounds absurdly simple, but it's not. Uh, determining the length and the uh, origin, point of origin and the point of termination for each line, as you can see in these installation walls, and uh, over time uh, they accumulate, so it creates this complete drawing. And uh, usually his works were completed by students, and uh, so he disinvested himself from the idea of having to do all the work himself, and it was very liberating in terms of allowing himself to create uh, permutation after permutation from these ideas that were generative. 
And uh, so you get involved, I guess you could get involved in science and math and music to think of Saul the Wit and the, the way that he created his art. Um, this is just an example of students drawing, uh, practice drawing that they're going to do later for a benefit drawing. And ironically, uh, this was begun just in April of this year, but Saul the Wit died in 2007, so his eyes, ideas are still generative and carrying on. He did include color in some of his wall drawings, <clears throat> and it turns out that the, uh, uh, the titles are basically the description. Red, blue, and white crayon, black pencil grid on yellow wall. And uh, many of these are in uh, private collections. Some of them are in art museums and so forth. Uh, but I think one of the works that I came to admire the most from Solowit was a book, which probably now if you had the book, the published book, it was a limited edition, you'd have a fabulous work of art. Because every page, had the directions, and then the, the, on the facing page had the, the executed work. And this one it is described perfectly. Black circles, red grid, yellow arcs from four sides, and blue arcs from four corners. And it's just a page in a book, but it's so much more because it's, it just starts your mind thinking about, for example, a musical composition. So I learned a lot from that, uh, that one professor that made us write about what we hated. Okay, well, uh, one of the things that I want to cover is basically why do we go to view art, whether it's in a gallery, like here at the Art Center, uh, or if we travel to see it. I've been fortunate to travel in my life, and uh, some people even buy art and make a huge investment in it, like John Powers did. Um, one of the things that I mentioned was to go beyond mere entertainment. Uh, I think a lot of people go to look at art because they want to feel inspired. They just want to have a refreshing thing to think about that's different from their own thoughts. Uh, reflecting upon the meaning of your life. I do that a little bit too often, I think. Um, also, we go uh, and view exhibits to invest in and encourage amazing local artists. Uh, I love to go see what a you know, watercolorist is doing or a sculptor is doing, someone that's carved something out of wood. Um, some people might enjoy uh, going on a spiritual quest or a pilgrimage even. There are still people that travel the entire uh, pilgrimage road in uh, Spain, uh, uh, the Santiago Road. And it, I think it takes like three months or something if you're going to go to all the churches on the site. And um, also uh, gain meaning from, uh, you know, in our own lives, from looking at <clears throat> what other people have done. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting ourselves out the front door. And uh, I have not experienced the Van Gogh exper immersive experience, but I've read some reviews online about it. And I think it might be one of those things where it just encourages people to go out and experience something new. Um, some people really liked it, some people didn't like it. What, what you get is, for between 60 and $90, uh, you go into a big, huge warehouse-like structure or art museum, and they have reproductions of Vincent Van Gogh's artwork in, in the scale that it's in. I mean, some of his paintings aren't really that big. Uh, what's missing is texture, but at least you kind of know what you're looking at. So it's a great introduction if you have kids along you know, kind of introduce them to an artist that's so almost overpopular. Movies have been made about him and so forth. Uh, then once you get into the immersive experience, you're surrounded by big, huge projections. And also, uh, there's a little diorama room. You can see the kids sitting in the room, his room at Arles. And uh, so you get a sense of his life. There are sounds as well, a narrative that kind of carries on with excerpts from his letters to his brother, Theo. So, uh, I would say, try it. Uh, maybe you'll like it, and maybe it'll just be one of those interesting experiences. Um, uh, one person commented that uh, while she was sitting in the circle listening to the narrative, she got cold. <laughs> so 
I guess it would be a good idea to take a sweater. <laughs> Another uh, immersive experience that's going around quite popular right now is the Wolf Meow installations, or Meow Wolf. I, I guess I have it backwards on the text. And that, that's a convergence of artists who do installation art that's constantly changing. I, I know there's been a convergence there in uh, Denver. There's one in Santa Fe. It was started up, these things always take money to start up, and um, George R. R. Martin, if anybody's a fan of the Game of Thrones TV series, he's the author of those books, and he uh, paid for a lot of that. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine reviewed it as a cool, mind-bending experience, and I, I read uh, on one of their uh, sort of overviews of their site that it's basically designed to inspire people to become creative. So it's kind of an inception point. And there, there are people inside the installation. They guide you. There's places where you can go in and play and move things around. So it's interactive. Uh, so I, I, if, I were, if I ended up in a place where it was, sometime I might bother to go through just to see how it made me respond to it. There's just a couple more visuals of it. Well, another way that we maybe uh, can approach uh, viewing art without buying it or buying it and, you know, not own it. <laughs> because basically that, that phrase of the, my title is, there's more to it than owning something. It's in fact, if you put your eye prints on something, you own it. So um, I'm not saying don't buy art, but I'm saying that it's bigger than that. Uh, art history, uh, doing a little bit of research, teaching our children about our heritage of the world and about different cultures and um, uh, places in the world uh, is a big part of uh, what I got involved in for over 20 years at CSU was just trying to show uh, people some of the things that are now considered world heritage sites and unfortunately they're also in danger because of the environment. Um, the Lesco Caves and the Chauvet Caves in France, you can't visit them. You can't go in. They're closed and there's a good reason for that because the uh, condensation from human breath causes the calcite on the cave walls to just fall off. So uh, instead of going traveling and visiting these places, what can we do? And uh, another one of the things that I love to do is research. Uh, and I found there was a beautiful book uh, for this particular cave, the Cap Chauvet Caves, which were not, they were discovered not long ago, actually. A beautiful book published by the discoverers. They were uh, spelunking when they found it. And um, it has beautiful photographs in it. And, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's just something I would love, if I ever got a chance, like with a National Geographic team or something, I would love to go, but chances of that are pretty slim. So prehistoric sites, um, things like Stonehenge. Is anybody here a Druid? <laughs> They're opening it up on uh, the equinox that's coming up next weekend, so that uh, people who practice that religion can actually go to the uh, Wiltshire site and uh, go to Stonehenge. And one of the reasons I threw this uh, in was because it is a symbolic or iconic image of what I call astroarchaeology, or if you want to turn it around, you can call it um, archaeoastronomy. Ancient people noticing the patterns of the stars, uh, using the sun to uh, date their year, you know, calendar year, and, and even plant their harvest by that. And uh, Stonehenge ha actually happens to be an astronomical calendar, as well as whatever else it was used for. It, uh, at certain points in the time of the year, like the equinox or the solstices, the sun lines up with certain uh, stones that have been placed into the ground. So they know that was at least one use for it. And uh, the Egyptian tombs, again, another site that very difficult to travel to. Once you get there, it's going to be very crowded. If you get in there, uh, you'll be kind of guided through and in and out uh, because there are so many tourists, and maybe not anymore. But anyway, uh, all of these sites have features that I would love to see in person, but I may never get to do that. 
So instead, I can uh, do a lot of research and maintain a sense of wonder about these objects that were created by people. You know, way back, my dad collected uh, arrowheads before it was illegal. And um, it, one time when I was a little kid, he just put this tool in my hands and it just made such an impression on me because I felt like I was holding the same tool that uh, a person who lived hundreds of years ago uh, was, had been holding or, or possibly even made. Here's a couple more examples, just quickly. I don't want to stall out on this, but uh, have anybody ever traveled where they went to some of the large cathedrals in Europe? Uh, did, did you get to stay in there a long time? Um, uh, yeah, just kind of wandering around. Did you happen to be in there when there was a concert going on? That, that's a really great, I mean, if you happen to be in the right place at the right time, that's a nice way to experience the acoustics. Uh, one of the things that you could investigate about something like this, and I really advise people to do research before they travel because it enhances your experience a lot. Uh, I stumbled across a book called The Power of Limits by Georgi uh, Doxi, and I, I have a reference list if anybody's interested at the end. Uh, he talks about sacred geometry, and I, I don't really know anything about math, but uh, basically uh, different cultures, including the Greeks, came up with what they call uh, sacred proportions. The Greeks came up with one called the uh, golden rectangle, and the proportions are, you know, side to length to height. And uh, if you get it right, you've created something that harmonizes with the universe, uh, within that structure is the divine. And uh, of course, these people who uh, worked on Amiens Cathedral or Notre Dame of Chartres or in Paris were aware of these and they used some of those. So that the ultimate goal was to try to create every part of that building harmonizing together to create a sense of the divine, even the stained glass windows and everything. So that's just another little something extra to know if you, if you happen to be in those spaces and if you can be there when a concert's happening, yeah, even better because they designed the, the uh, space so that the acoustics would be amazing. Um, one place that I'd like to go, that I probably won't make it there, <laughs> is uh, uh, some rock cut caves in Elephanta, India. and. Uh, Joseph Campbell describes this cave uh, temple really well because uh, he, he did a uh, documentary series called The Power of Myth way back in the, I think it was in the 80s, 70s or 80s. And uh, what happens is because this is cut into deep caves, as you go in, your eyes don't see anything. And uh, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust. We're seeing it illuminated for the photographic purposes. But uh, imagine seeing this 15 foot high serene sculpture of Shiva as Mahadeva, uh, an embodiment of that particular god as uh, the, combining the elements that are disparate or opposites and bringing them into harmony. And uh, after a while of being in the dark, it just sort of emerges out of the dark in front of you massively. So uh, that's kind of that would be a nice effect to experience physically. Okay, this is a, an example of something that we could do with a work of art hanging in the gallery in there, or we could do it with something that uh, we're as tourists just seeing for the first time. And that's what I call a case study on something. I, I did this one for my students because it was uh, coming up right while uh, I was still teaching in the 1990s. And it's the Arapachus altar in Rome. I'm not, not going to go into a lot of detail. There's lots of information out there about this altar. But originally it was uh, built during uh, the Augustan uh, period. And it was for worship and sacrifice of animals and things like that, uh, which was part of the civic uh, structure of Rome at the time. Beautiful relief sculptures. Uh, like this Gaia panel that's probably about as high as I am. Uh, exquisite works of art. 
the building disappeared. It was completely disassembled and it ended up in the foundations of another Roman building for a while. In the 1930s, it was re-excavated and uh, Mussolini decided that he was going to use it as part of his fascist regime, regime in Italy. And uh, so he had a, uh, one of his architects build this really gloomy building to protect it and they put it back together. It's an amazing story. Uh, so here comes the Arapachis again, it zoomed out of the ground. Originally it was designed to be in a huge courtyard in the Augustan Palace area in Rome. And uh, it was part of what, what's called a orologium or a giant sundial. And uh, there was an obelisk in the middle. Over there on the left you can see a diagram of it. And the Arapachis was just a part of the sundial. So it was sort of like a way of telling when they needed to do their sacrifices and when they needed to pay their taxes and when they needed to go. It was sort of like to going to church and going to the bank at the same time. <laughs> and um, when you do these kind of case studies and read magazines about these particular artifacts or objects, you find out uh, odd things. Like most of us, uh, when we've gone to museums, you know, like in the British Museum where you see the elegant marbles or whatever, they're white, pure white, and you just think, wow, how sublime. Uh, and I was actually almost disillusioned to find out that the Greeks and Rome, the Romans painted their sculpture. And uh, I was like, well, that's kind of mind-blowing. I don't really like it that way. Because <laughs> I first saw it all, uh, all white. So it looks kind of garish to my eyes. But anyway, you find out these interesting things. Well, to end the case study, you bring what you do is you find out everything you can about one object. And uh, Richard Meyer, the architect of the Getty in Los Angeles, was awarded uh, the design for a, a new structure to put this building in a, a better place where people could learn about its history. Uh, they got it all restored as much as possible. There are still some parts missing on the panels. And uh, some of the Italians thought that his architecture was too modern for uh, Rome, but it still won out, and it's in a very nice location where, where it's accessible, where people can go see it and uh, try to understand it. Okay, we're moving on to another segment of what I wanted to talk about for art that you can buy, but you can't own it, and that's art that's temporary. Uh, it just exists in an environment for a very brief amount of time. I don't know if any of you were around when uh, Christo and Jean-Claude did the uh, Valley Curtain. Uh, did you get to see it when it was up? I didn't see it, I just read about it. Okay. Yeah, because actually it was, I mean, it was quite a project over in Rifle, and people were talking about it out on the golf course and everything, and uh, it only got to be up for about a day because of the high winds that uh, rip through rifle. But uh, it's an interesting process to understand and think about these artists doing something like this. The Marin County uh, uh, project called The Running Fence was one of his most expansive projects. And it ran 24 miles across two counties and down into the ocean uh, in California. Months and years of preparation and planning. And the way that they funded it was to create these beautiful, you know, they're, they're just luscious drawings with plans, site plans, and architectural, you know, grids and things like that on it that make it look like a nice, you know, something really interesting that got worked on a lot. Uh, their signatures, of course, samples of the fabric that they wanted to use. So their plans and their proposals, and they were works of art that were frameable, tangible, that people could buy. And that's how they funded a huge project like this that would cost millions. They also had to go to uh, town council meetings, uh, go to, <laughs> uh, go to um, private landowners and say, hey, could we run a fabric fence across your land? <laughs> Guess how that would go over. <laughs> and oh, by the way, we promised to put everything back the way it was. Well, how many people believe that? But they really did it, and it cost millions. But uh, the thing that really boggled most people's minds about it was that they were temporary. I mean, it took them almost four years to get uh, the um, whole process going for it and uh, the money raised and the fabrication 
of the running fence and then it came down within two weeks. And uh, I think they had to do a lot of, you know, like pulling out the concrete plugs and stuff and restoring the land and putting it back. Some segments were taken away even sooner than that because people had livestock that needed to get through. So they had places, breaks in the, in the fence, but uh, it just was mind-boggling to people to think of something that was that big of a project that would only be up temporarily like that. So that's, that's kind of what I'm driving at with my title. Uh, even if you own one of those beautiful drawings, and they are beautiful renderings that have the idea going forward in it, uh, there's just this sense of ephemerality. It's gone. You, you'll never see it on Earth again. They did all kinds of projects all around the world. They wrapped um, the Pont Neuf Bridge in uh, Paris. They wrapped a bunch of islands off the coast of Florida. Those, are, those were spectacular if you could get up in a helicopter to see them. But again, they were only temporary because they didn't want to damage the environment. Another kind of temporary art that's sort of hit, I call it hit and run art, was uh, Jenny Holzer. And she uses words as her, uh, her art form. Uh, there was an interesting movie that came out that I think was patterned after Jenny Holzer uh, with, um, uh, I can't remember the famous actress in it, but uh, Jodie Foster. It was called Incognito, and um, the artist uh, is famous for her word art in that I won't give away the plot. You can watch it if you want. <laughs> Um, she gets chased around the country by David, uh, uh, Dennis Hopper, who's trying to kill her. <laughs> so, um, uh, the interesting thing about Jenny Holzer's work is that she has inserted these words or phrases into an environment where you are uh, not expecting to come across them. And it just catches you off guard. And uh, to imagine, you know, walking down a street in New York and having a truck drive brought by that says, the truth is my subject. Or going out to Las Vegas where you're gonna gamble and having a sign that says, protect me from what I want. <laughs> or being in an airport that says, money creates taste. So uh, they just, they kind of throw you sideways a little bit. And uh, people have asked me, well, how would an artist like that sell their work? Well, she does, she makes posters, t-shirts, things like that, and uh, framed works of art that are the, the truisms. So uh, she's kind of an activist, I would say. Uh, she did do some installations in conventional sites like the Guggenheim Museum in New York, which has a huge spiral uh, ramp that goes up. Frank Lloyd Wright designed that to be an atrium where people could kind of recover from seeing so much art. It's like a restful place to be. And she used the, the banisters around the spiral uh, ramp to uh, put her word art. And of course, one that we're all familiar with, which I think is powerful, is memorials. Uh, they're a public form of art. They have to go into a site where people are going to come together for ceremonies or for individual meditation. And uh, Maya Lin uh, was only 21, a student at Yale, when she designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I know they've had the uh, replica of it uh, come through a couple of times. And uh, one of the things that's missing from that replica, even though I, I see people still having a profound experience with it, it's not as big, of course, as the original one. Uh, Maya Lin designed it to have polished granite walls. And so as you're looking at the names, you see yourself reflected in it and that sense of mortality and connection to the people who died. And she also designed the wall chronologically so that the names uh, go along chronologically rather than uh, alphabetically. Imagine you know, the horror of finding your dear one's name in a list of similar names uh, and having to hunt it out. So she put them chronologically, which made it very powerful. She was later awarded uh, to do this uh, memorial in Alabama for the Civil Rights Movement. And this one employs water, which is always very calming. And it runs across the table and has the names of many of the people who were part of the Civil Rights Movement. And a quote behind that uh, is from Martin Luther King. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream.
Okay, here's another little uh, bit about archaeoastronomy. Uh, <laughs> That's the way I call it. Nancy Holt created this amazing thing. This is another place where you'd have to go driving out in the desert in a jeep and stay overnight just to see it. <laughs> and um, so I don't think these artists were particularly motivated by money. They wanted to uh, relate to the stars. They wanted to relate to the earth. And uh, Holt is now dead, but I think that thing is still out there. And uh, you can go out there and spend the night, and uh, at certain times of year, the uh, constellations line up. The reason I'm mentioning, the, mentioning this is because uh, many of the uh, tribes in America, uh, pre-Columbian tribes, already had some kind of calendar device, like not as massive as Stonehenge, but that uh, charted the days and the pr progress of the sun. I included a couple of illustrations there. Uh, in Akiva, and also the sun dagger that's up on um, Chaco Canyon. Uh, Non-natives are not allowed to go up there because somebody vandalized it one time. This is leading up to, I, I guess I would call this artist the highlight of my talk, uh, James Terrell. And he uh, basically uses light as a sculptural material. Uh, it's kind of a novel idea. Uh, what he has uh, been quoted as saying is that he wants to help us see ourselves seeing. And uh, so what he does is uh, he creates these environments that are just flooded with light. And he also has a lot of the characteristics of uh, creativity that I admire, one of which is a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, it's hard to survive in the art world without it. Uh, he's very playful, but he also was raised as a Quaker, and so uh, early on, he had this sense of um, the, uh, the idea, the Quaker idea when you're meditating is that you go inside uh, to see the light. And so uh, this particular installation that I'm showing in different phases of lighting is called the light inside. And uh, so he's employing something that obviously has been on his mind since he was a kid. And uh, he's now 78. and. Uh, has done art installations all over the world. One of the ones that I thought had a sense of humor was Bridget Spardo. <laughs> uh, playing off the Tibetan idea of the netherworld where you just hang out if you die without becoming enlightened, you just go into a bardo. And uh, I just, that caught my attention. I hit, um, the idea is that your retina, the inside of your eye is bathed in an entire environment of light, and so uh, it illumines, illuminates you inside. And he's worked long and hard on this. One of his ideas that he's elaborated on is the use of an oculus uh, that opens up to the sky on an interior structure. I think it'd be really cool to have one of these right next to a sauna. <laughs> uh, this one is in uh, Yarna, Sweden, and uh, it changes the light inside the, the dome changes as the light in the oculus or the opening changes as well. This isn't really a new idea. I mean, the, uh, uh, there's a building in Rome that has an oculus in the top of it. And, you know, that was built when they first invented concrete, for Pete's sake. So it's not a new idea, but it's being employed in a special way to uh, use light. And uh, one of the big uh, impressive features that has been a lifelong passion for Terrell is the uh, Roden Crater Site out in Arizona. It's not even open to the public, don't get excited yet, because uh, if you wanted to go now, you'd have to pay about $7,000 and have a private viewing and stay out, stay out there for overnight. But um, it's planned to be open in uh, 2023. Uh, Terrell will be 80 by then. I hope he lives to see it open. What he's done is created the inside of an in, uh, uh, extinct uh, volcanic crater into an astronomical device. It's huge. And uh, the main uh, feature that uh, I happen to be looking at a Smithsonian magazine uh, for May of this year, and it featured him, and it just really intrigued me. Um, 
is to create a camera obscura that's so big that it pinholes the light into uh, the volcanic structure inside. And so that's what this oculus does. You can see it in one view here, it looks circular, but as you get closer to it, it turns into a huge oval. And what it does is funnel the light inside into the uh, volcano, which has been turned into an architectural structure, uh, so that you can see a projection of the uh, sky down on the floor. Uh, let me get you to the next slide here. Uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the idea of a camera obscura, but I'll explain it briefly. Uh, just a few views of his plan, uh, his site drawings, and a satellite picture of the Roden Crater site. So I really want to go out there. I want to sometime after it opens and the prices go down, I want to go out there and uh, see this. He's got a, a room in this. It's, I mean, it's being well planned out. It's just not open yet. Here's the uh, room that has all the drawings and uh, maquettes of the uh, volcano and stuff like that. Well, a camera obscura, in case you don't know, is basically, it just means in Italian, it means dark room. And uh, people discovered that um, even without a lens, if you make a little pinhole in a box, I, I think they had a kid's project at the libraries where the, uh, you make a pinhole camera. Uh, it's just that they didn't have film back then, so the artist had to be in uh, the room and uh, draw an upside-down version of what was being projected into the room. Now with lenses, of course, they can flip it, but they know now that um, uh, Vermeer used the camera obscura, and people often wondered why, uh, why the optical kind of beauty of like portraits improved so much in the Renaissance and stuff. And uh, David Hockney went uh, into a great deal of detail uh, in his book, Secret Knowledge, to reveal that he, and you know, people said, oh, well, that just means the artists didn't uh, have any talent, they were cheating. Well, I mean, if you use it, if you have a good tool and you use it, that's not cheating. So they were using the camera obscura, but it really changed the uh, direction of European history, uh, art history, um, at that time to a more optically perfect kind of art rather than uh, the more expressive kind that you might expect to see during the medieval period. David Hockney and himself, uh, I admire also his uh, qualities of creativity, which he's not afraid to investigate or explore. He's tried a lot of different things in his artistic career, collage, uh, photography. As an older artist, he's gone into creating drawings on an iPad and uh, just elaborating on landscapes and things like that. They're quite whimsical and uh, playful. Okay, one, one last big artist, and then I'm gonna just kind of taper off into some little details. <laughs> uh, I got to see uh, Bill Viola's art. And again, this is stuff I don't think I really wanna have one of these huge plasma screens in my home. Uh, but they're mesmerizing to look at in the gallery. And I, I went out to the Getty to a, a conference for uh, visual resources uh, back in 2002, I think it was. And they had these are huge plasma screens that stand about 8 to 12 feet high. And what Bill Viola has done is taken film or video, actually, to the extreme of slow motion. Uh, if you're watching an animated movie, uh, the frames go by your eye maybe about uh, 24 frames per second. And he uh, filmed things with such fast film that uh, it was like 200 frames per second. That's the analogy. And then he slows it down. So the movements that you're seeing would be fairly rapid for uh, normal viewing, but um, to watch it slow down, uh, is an interesting phenomenon because what happens in the gallery, uh, normal, normally people just sort of browse by works of art. Uh, they just sort of walk by and glimpse and then walk to the next one. Uh, in works like this, it takes about a half hour for the movement, like the woman's arms, to come up to her uh, face. It takes about a half hour. 
And uh, you're just mesmerized. And, and what happens is the gallery of viewers become self-conscious. They're sort of standing there going, well, this is weird. <laughs> I'm still standing here. It's a half hour later uh, instead of walking on through. Uh, so I found uh, Bill Viola's art to be something I wouldn't really, I, I think it'd be kind of haunting to have a, a video feed on a plasma screen in your home. I don't think I'd want to do that. But uh, in a gallery or some of the commercial settings where his work has appeared, it's really quite amazing. Okay, well, a few little last quips and bits about... Um, viewing art or appreciating art, if you will. Um, books. <laughs> Undeniably, books are a fabulous, fabulous resource. And uh, when I first moved here, I joined up with the uh, Little Hotchkiss book reading group, and one of the first books that we read was The uh, uh, Goldfinch by Donna Tart. And um, so I was intrigued, and uh, I really didn't know that much about this artist. So, I, of course, I was asked to, because I had the title of art person, <laughs> I was asked to do the presentation for the library group. Um, I looked him up, and he was a student of Rembrandt, uh, uh, Carol Fabritius. Anybody heard of him? Uh, he died young. He was in his 30s, and his studio was above an armory, and it blew up. So he was killed. And many, many of his works, which were probably masterpieces, were destroyed. This little tiny painting, which you can see the scale of it in this slide there, uh, was one that survived. And I thought it was interesting that Donna Tart chose it as an uh, emblematic work for her book. Uh, because it's got this little bird that's chained to a perch. And in the book, her protagonist becomes... Uh, tethered to this work of art because it's been stolen and he's taking care of it, he thinks. Uh, so I won't give it away, but it's a great read. It, it won a Pulitzer Prize back in uh, 2014. So it's well worth reading and it focuses on this tiny little work of art. I found out so much about that. I had to look up Carol Fabridius because in all my teaching days I'd never even heard of him. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Another book that came along uh, was the portrait of, uh, it was called The Lady in Gold, The Extraordinary Tale of Gustav Klimt's Masterpiece, Portrait of Adele Blockbauer. And uh, it was written uh, by uh, Anne Marie O'Connor. It was later turned into a film in 2015 called Woman in Gold. And it's, this piece is also mentioned in a film called uh, Monuments Men. If anybody saw that movie. Uh, the guys are actually rescuing, uh, George Clooney, uh, rescuing um, works of art from salt mines and caves and things where the Nazis had stowed them. And it's amazing that they didn't get blown up because the, when the Nazis left Vienna, uh, they pretty much decided if we can't have it, nobody can have it. So they blew up a lot of places too. So uh, you learn a lot about the Vienna secessionist movement. We learned a lot about the Nazis coming into um, Vienna. I mean, they welcomed Hitler because he was born in Linz, which was not far from Vienna. So they, they were like, welcome, come back home. Uh, after I read this book uh, and got to um, kind of learn a lot about this painting, um, I traveled to Vienna. And uh, that was an exquisite experience. I got to uh, go and uh, see so many museums. There are over 80 museums in Vienna. Not all of them are art museums, and I picked about five <laughs> in the time I was there. Uh, it was just overwhelming, the amount of art and music. The musical climate there is incredible. Uh, but I did get to go to a, a exhibit of Gustav Klimt's work in the Belvedere Palace, which has been turned into pretty much an art gallery. And uh, I had a really ex odd experience there. Uh, this would be on the side of how not to experience art. Uh, they were featuring The Kiss, which is a famous painting by Klimt. It's probably one of his most famous paintings. They don't always have it out on exhibit. 
And uh, so it was, it was out, it was standing on an easel. And uh, people could kind of walk by, and they had things around that said no pictures. But of course people were grabbing their cell phones and, you know, taking pictures and stuff like that. And it's not as bad, they, but the guards allow it because it's not a flash picture, which can damage some pigments and things on paintings. But I was, I actually, I thought, well, here I am, I'll look at this painting. And um, so I was standing in front of it about four feet away from it, and this American tourist came and literally shoved me out of the way. And he said, I need to take a selfie of myself with this painting. So he shoved me out of the way, went like this, took a picture and walked out of the room. He didn't even look at the painting. <laughs> but, oh, what an age. <laughs> But, while well, I was, uh, I mean, I did get to look at the painting eventually, but uh, while I was sort of flustered by that experience, I walked around the corner and found uh, another painting by Gustav Klimt called Judith and Hole of Fernies, which is also thought to be a portrait of Adele Block Bauer. So, uh, even though the portrait of uh, Adele Block Bauer that's in that movie and book isn't even in Vienna, and there's a whole big story of why that's true. Um, I got to see something that was very similar in the style and gold overlay that was done by him that had a portrait of her. I found it amazing too because in art, if you're teaching art history, you end up seeing a whole bunch of uh, paintings of the killing of Holofernes by Artemisia. And in some, uh, you know, um, the Judith is the main feature, and she's slicing his head off. It's very dramatic, the Baroque painting of it. Uh, another one is pretty much, Judith uh, is sort of sidelined by the horror of Holofernes' neck being slashed, and he's in the middle of the painting. And in this one, Klimt has basically relegated Holofernes' head to a tiny slice uh, on the right-hand corner. She's just holding his hair. <laughs> and she's like, I'm done with this. <laughs> So, anyway, I got a lot of um, enjoyment out of seeing that painting just by accident that I didn't even know was in that gallery. And a beautiful array of landscapes by Klimt. I didn't even know he did landscapes. In fact, I have a grievance with most of the art history books I've ever taught from, which is that they pretty much skip over the whole Vienna scene. I don't know why they do that. I mean, we talk about the German expressions and everything, but Vienna just gets overlooked a lot. Well, anyway, while I was there in Vienna, um, my friend and I that traveled together, maybe some of you know her, Georgia Finnegan, uh, she and I got a, a day together to go to um, uh, the theater museum. And it's a very small museum in Vienna. And um, I actually made the guards suspicious with what I was doing there because I'm not even that much of an admirer of Peter Paul Rubens. I've seen lots of his large paintings. Most of those big paintings, they might be as big as that wall there, uh, were mostly executed by his students in an atelier or a workshop. He trained them how to paint draperies, how to paint landscape, how to paint horses, how to paint you know, little plants and stuff. And then he would come in at the end and do uh, the finishing touches of the portraits and stuff like that. And he became almost kind of like a celebrity in the art world because he traveled to Italy, he got to see Michelangelo's paintings and sculptures. Uh, he, he really became kind of an entrepreneurial figure in the art world, and he realized that he could do these huge paintings that were portraits of royalty. Uh, but I always felt like there was something kind of commercial about his art. But when I walked into this room that had about 15 oil sketches that were only about this big, that had been executed completely in his hand. I was pulled in, and I spent <laughs> so long in that room that the guards, you know, they walk by and kind of cluck at me like, you know, what are you doing still in this room? <laughs> and um, so I spent quite a bit of time, and uh, Georgia and I got a chance to look at, in the same museum, same uh, exhibit and everything, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, Bosch's Last Judgment which is a triptych painting, just like you're probably more familiar with, you've heard of Bosch, of his Garden of Earthly Delights. And it's full of these little dioramic scenes with uh, 
possibly uh, something hellish going on. Uh, someone crucified across a harp with the harp strings pier piercing right through the, uh, the body. Uh, strange, monstrous creatures, people in little glass globes that have alchemical uh, symbol symbolism and so forth. It's just so complex that it's hard to look at. And this painting I, was the same. Georgia and I st stood around and looked at it, and on the back are paintings on the back because it's a folding triptych. It's designed to close. And uh, we, so we walked around behind it, and the guard came and was like, what are you doing? <laughs> So uh, we, we enjoyed, spent, we got to spend about a half hour uh, looking at this painting and um, trying to understand some of the symbolism that went on. I first encountered Bosch in a psychedelic paint, uh, poster back in the 70s in a roommate's um, wall. Uh, it glowed in the dark and everything. <laughs> and I didn't really know much about Bosch then, but uh, I've kind of appreciated him as, uh, as kind of a prefigure of the Surrealist movement in the 30s, but he's from the 15th century, so he wasn't thinking surrealistically. He was trying to teach people uh, good from evil. Uh, I ended up finding out a lot about Bosch from a book that I uh, would really recommend. It's called Leap by Terry Tempest Williams, and she mostly writes about Utah and nature. But this was a, a kind of a sideline for her. Uh, she spent uh, about six months in Spain. And so she decided to go to the Prado almost every day that she was able to go. And she meditated on Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, which was there at the Prado. And uh, I just love that book because she basically does um, what I call ekphrasis. It's a Greek word that means to describe or explain so explicitly some object that you can see in your mind, you can see every detail. And um, <clears throat> so this book is basically an exercise in ekphrasis. And I have a, um, well, even the notes were quote, the, and the quotes from her, the end of her book, are well worth reading and getting involved in. Uh, Federico Garcia Lorca is quoted is talking about El Duende, uh, which is basically the struggle inside that threatens to make art. And I think any, any creative soul can identify with that. Um, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, oh, yeah, the ekphrasis thing. I decided to go ahead and turn it into a, a game for you guys. <laughs> we don't have to do it. Don't worry. We don't have to do it. <laughs> Nothing embarrassing is going to happen. But um, I created a, a description of a work of art for someone who wanted it for insurance purposes. So I went through the exercise of the crisis. And while I was doing that, I thought, you know what, this would make a really fun game. And uh, so basically the rules of the game are you have yourself or you have a friendly adversary assign you, just like my professor did, some work of art that you don't know anything about or that you don't understand. And, uh, or maybe you don't like it. <laughs> and you have to find out everything you can about it. And then you go through a sort of uh, uh, classifying it. You know, what is it? Is it a painting? Is it a sculpture? Is it a building? Um, then you uh, describe it completely. So you go through the ekphrasis process. Then you classify it, and, uh, and finally, after going through all of those uh, processes, you can offer your own opinion. And then hopefully it'll be a little bit more of an educated opinion than you would have had, other than just saying, I don't like it, <laughs> like I did with Solomon. So over here I have examples of um, the phrases, the game, and uh, so it goes through classifying, describing, explaining, and interpreting. And uh, you can get points for depth of understanding, uh, creative but accurate interpretation of a work of art, uh, accuracy of history, best worded and most complete descriptions employing the most formal elements and art and, co art and compositional elements. And of course, I've included those. You can find them in any art history text. Things like line, color, shape, 
you know, stuff like that. Purposes for art. Uh, so it'll give you a review of uh, maybe if you had to take one of those dreadful college humanities courses <laughs> of art history. It'll bring back some really fond memories for you. Um, I have, oh yeah, I have one more slide that I'll just put up while we're chatting. Uh, just suggestions and ideas about why uh, why we do what we do and, and ways to appreciate art, um, even if you don't buy it or if you don't own it. So, thank you. How do you feel about speaking? And I said, well, I've been retired for 11 years now, and it's kind of like pulling that old Jeep out of the garage and seeing if it'll crank. <laughs> well, it worked pretty well. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I think I digressed a little bit there. I got a little art, art history-ish on you. Yeah. But, well, I don't think so. Anyway, feel free to take these. I enjoy. I have. One of the things I thought was really interesting is that maybe